thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Book topics. Call this January 16th, 2024 uh, meeting of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners to order. Um, in the absence of our chair, John Paisley, I'm in Vice Chair Steve Carter, and I will be running tonight's meeting. Um, John has a stomach virus, so. Um, I have the uh, uh, invocation, so if you will join me, we'll open with a word of prayer. Father God, as we approach you tonight, dear Lord, we just seek your guidance, your presence, the power of your spirit, dear Lord, to lead us to help us to make the right decisions for the citizens of Alamance County. The important thing, dear Lord, is for us to be in alignment with your word, to do the right thing, and to make good decisions. We ask, dear Father, that you be with us, keep us all safe and sound tonight, give us tra uh, traveling mercies as we go home, and uh, take us into the balance of this week and help us have a productive time for the citizens in this community. We ask all this, dear Lord, in, our, in your powerful and holy name. Amen. Amen. Join me for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay. Okay, do I have a motion concerning the agenda? So moved. Second? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Okay, the agenda is approved. Um, public comments, we have two signed up. Uh, Judge Tom Lambeth. You have any proof of identification that you're a resident of Alamance County, Judge? I, uh, I'll ask you to take my word for it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good evening to uh, Good evening. all of you guys, and Happy New Year. Happy okay. New Year to everybody. I will keep this very brief. We um, kind of got on the radar last week that there's going to be a presentation, and this is a tongue twister, opioid settlement funds. Uh, and I just wanted to give a quick sort of look back and maybe a look ahead. And Judge Larry Brown may walk in any minute. He's on baby duty. I talked to him about an hour ago. He was trying to, to get here. Um, but... We had a drug court, a, a, a treatment recovery court, drug uh, court, back a number of years ago when I was a district court judge, and Judge Robertson was our chief district court judge at the time, appointed me to run that court, and it was an honor and a privilege to do so, and we had it for three years until the federal funding ran out. It was a grant, a grant court, uh, and we had good success with it, uh, and I was struck by uh, what wonderful across the board support there is for drug courts on all sides of the aisle and I will just tell you I went to a drug national drug court conference and for the first time realized that when I heard Senator Rand Paul give a very mm -hmm. uh, hearty endorsement for the program and others on the other side including Martin Sheen and others who were politically di diametrically opposite all made the point how effective drug treatment courts are and this is so timely because we, we are, our, and the sheriff probably should be here saying this instead of me, but our community, like communities all across our, mm -hmm. our nation and world, are just being ravaged by drug addiction. And it breaks my heart. And I say this in court almost weekly. I have to sign an abatement order, which means that somebody who's been put on probation to try to get help or somebody who hasn't even gotten through the system yet, they still have a pending case, their cases are abated because they have died. Mm -hmm. And more times than not, it's from opioid or other drug addiction. You know, fentanyl is, is just, it's, it's despicable. Uh, it's being laced in, uh, uh, in drugs by, by drug dealers, and it's killing people. And as bad as, as street drugs and as dangerous as, as they've always been, I think maybe it's the worst that I've ever known of right now. And so 
when we have a, a opportunity like uh, this opioid <coughs> settlement to try and make a direct difference in our community, I can think of no more direct appropriate use of opioid funds than to have a drug treatment court where we can start to make a difference and make a dent one soul at a time in, uh, in this crisis. And it really is, it's truly a crisis. And I was, had a, a brief uh, conversation with the health director and, and just made the point, it's really not very expensive. I mean, if you talk about the cost and the, and the return on investment, it's enormous. Judges are already here. We are already salaried. Clerks are already here. They are salaried. Uh, bailiffs, others are here. Really, the only uh, main expense is to hire a, a very important position, a drug court coordinator who keeps up with the clients who have to appear in front of a judge. The, the model typically is once a week. They come and, and appear in front of a judge for accountability, which is really the key for why Hallett works so well. So I just wanted to make that pitch and just get on the early radar here uh, um, as y'all start to consider it. And that's all. And we'll certainly be, uh, be very active. Our whole court system is, is completely in agreement that this is an important new step for us in our county. And I wholeheartedly hope that you guys will, uh, will take a look at it and, and consider it. And I, this is a great segue. Judge Brown, who is a, a, a wonderful new father, has just uh, been able to rush over here. And I'm going to segue because Judge Brown and Judge Hanford particularly, although all of our judges have been supportive, they in particular have sort of been a big part of the information gathering. And we spoke to you all, if you remember, a few a couple years ago maybe. Uh, and, and so I'm just going to segue and ask him to just speak a little bit. But I just want to implore you that. Uh, I can think of really no better use for the funds, and just a small portion of the funds too. This is not uh, not going to be a big part. Now, one of the questions I will just float, and I have no idea what the answer is. I don't know if the opioid funds allow for any sort of facilities help. You know, we're going to have enough judges, we're going to have enough personnel. Facilities are going to continue to be a struggle for us as we as our courthouse just gets busier and busier. And I'm not sure the answer to that, uh, but that's kind of a secondary question. I mean, we'll figure something out. Y'all will figure something out in cooperation with uh, with everyone. So thank you. Judge Brown, can I just ask you to um, Judge Brown, how are you doing tonight? Good evening to everyone. Thank God for the opportunity to be here um, and also be before this honorable board to Vice Chair Carter, Commissioner, T Commissioner T Turner, Commissioner Lashley, Commissioner Thompson, I want to say thank you all for allowing me the opportunity to be here. Um, January the 10th, we lost a true champion of courage here in Alamance County, um, someone that I greatly love and I greatly admire when the Honorable Judge Stephen H. Messick passed away. He epitomized to me what everything that a judge should be, ethical, well-versed in the law, a fighter for justice, a fighter for equality. His spirit, his presence will be greatly missed here in Alamance County. And I find it fitting that his family, the amazing Messick family, decided to lay their father and their husband to rest on the day celebrating Judge Messick's legacy is the same day celebrating also Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy as well. I, along with Judge Messick, along with Dr. King, believe in equal justice for all, equality for all. Why do I say all that to you? Because I heard Judge Messick's voice this morning, and I heard my father's voice this morning, and both of them said, Junior, get back to work. The MLK speeches have been made, very important speeches. The MLK marches, they have been completed, very important marches. But now it's time to get to work to make lasting change, something that I know all of you work hard to do every single day, as do I. You have the ability to make lasting change. I'm not going to waste your time, commissioners. You know what the need is. You know how dire it is to have a drug treatment court, a drug recovery court here. If you don't believe me, please visit court any day of the week. About a year and a half ago, Commissioner Thompson, tell me if I'm wrong, about a year and a half ago, I, along with the Honorable Commissioner Thompson, with Clerk Meredith Edwards, with, I know I'm going to wind up forgetting someone, DSS Attorney Jamie Hamlet, um, 
attorney uh, attorney uh, Haygood. Attorney Haygood was there. Also from the district attorney's office, um, assistant district attorney Whitney was there. The probation chief, Lydia Smallwood, was there. A consortium of a group of leaders here in Alamance County went and we visited Orange County to see what their drug recovery court looks like. I know I'm pressed for time, so commissioners, I'll just say it works. It works. My grandmother would always say, baby, <laughs> if you always do what you've always done, you always going to get what you always got. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sitting here encouraging you. We need to do something different. And you have the ability to make that happen. There were some issues. We had several meetings after we went to Orange County and saw their process. Several meetings. We did um, spoke with several individuals. Numerous meetings. Tell me if I'm wrong. And we kind of created a blueprint of what it would look like because we don't have to have, because of finances, because of facilities, we did not have a, a judge in order to do so. Now we're about to have a fifth judge. We still have to deal with the facility issue. But again, you have the opportunity to make this lasting change because that's what we're all here for, to help others. Drug addiction is real. And if we can help somebody as we travel along, then our living will not be in vain. Because if we can help someone kick drug addiction, it benefits them, their families, their children. But guess what? It benefits all of us as well. So whatever you need of us, we're here. The Honorable Judge, Chief Judge Overby, she could not make it this evening. She's in support of this. We want y'all to know that leadership is in support of this. So whatever you need of us, we are here. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Judge Brown. Thank and you. can I say one more thing? You certainly may. Your job is extremely difficult. I wonder sometimes as people realize how difficult being a commissioner really is. It's the same pool of money and you have all of these entities coming for that same pool and the money doesn't increase. That pool that year, that's the funds that you have to work with to create a budget. That's not an easy task to do. I want you to know Commissioner Turner. I want you to know Commissioner Carter, Commissioner Lashley, Commissioner Thompson, and in his, in his, in his absence, Chair Paisley. I pray for y'all every night that God will lead you in the direction that you need to go to make these important decisions. Because I know it's not easy. We're just asking for you to consider that portion of the opioid money, if possible, for a drug recovery court. It benefits us all. God bless you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Judge Brown. Okay, do we have a motion on the consent agenda? So moved. Did you have something, Craig? And I'm happy to second it. I just had a couple of questions, Mr. Uh, Commissioner Carter. That, uh, not that I'm opposed. I just want some more clarification, if I may. From sure. You. So can we open that up for discussion? Certainly. Sure. Um, I had a question about 5B1, mm -hmm. the school's capital project fund decrease by 5000 That's not a lot of money. I'm just wondering what that's, what's that a refund for uh, and what that, what that goes to? So that was closing out a state lottery project. And so those funds have now already been approved by DPI. This is correcting our budget in aligned with that. So those funds have been returned to the unallocated portion and can be requested at a later date. Okay. And what was the project? And if I'm not mistaken, it was a project at Western High School. Okay. The, the Cane Creek Mountain Recreational Trail grant approval. So that's an approval of a grant, but also the county's putting in some cash for that. Is that in addition to what was originally let me look at that one well i think it's twenty-seven thousand. i was thinking there was not a match required for that let me twenty no. thousand in sorry cash. i need to find that one no, no match was required yes. but jamie's here she can speak to it i have it jamie if you need yeah, to see that's the numbers fine. thank you so originally, um, it was no match, but uh, it's being corrected that we are matching with some operating funds to cover the cost of engineering design of the parking lot. 
and the entrance sign and gate, which we normally cover in a project like this anyway, yeah. but it wasn't included the first time we submitted. Can you just give the public just for the information about what, what this grant does and what this project is? Yep, this is the third phase of Cane Creek uh, Mountain Natural Area, which will add another seven to eight miles of hiking trail in the snow camp area. We have two phases that are already open. Um, the Pine Hill and the Oak Hill Trailheads, and this will be the third phase of that project. And this grant will help cover the cost of the parking lot and trailhead. And then we work with our Mountains to Sea Trail volunteers of the Alamance County Task Force to uh, actually build the trail itself. So part of it is their in-kind donation of their labor as okay. well. So this is essentially like a 10% match from the county. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and this also involves parks and rec but the i think it would be helpful for the public to know about the request for the from the smith reynolds foundation yep and what that does and and, and where that that grant would go like physically what spaces those would go to yeah absolutely so our programming staff had come up with a plan to try to introduce an after school athletics program and this grant is one that we found it's a, it's a private organization that has a grant for improving things in the community and so we were taking a swing at it to see if uh, it's a little bit of funding I think it's about forty seven thousand dollars to help mm -hmm. with some equipment and staffing some part-time positions for over a two-year period to help introduce that at one or two schools in the county this would be a supplement to a school that already has an after-school program for this part-time staff to come in and do some organized after-school athletic programming so that's in consultation with ABSS? Yeah. 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 I, mean, I think that's a really worthwhile endeavor. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate that. That's all I had, Mr. Uh, Carter. Okay. Mr. Carter. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All in favor, or any other discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Okay. Presentations and other business. Opioid Settlement Fund. Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to come before you tonight. My name is Ashley Barber, and I'm the Coordinator of Health Services. During my presentation, thank you, I will provide you with opioid settlement updates, a general overview of Exhibit A and B, discuss what's happening in other counties, where we are now in Alamance County, and what's next. Since our last annual meeting on March the 20th, 2023, the amount of the settlement funds Alamance County is anticipated to receive increased from $8,874,733 to $16,105,082. As of November the 30th, 2023, we have received $1,813,736.29 in settlement payments, six, excuse me, 64,919 and 11 cent in interest earned and a total of 1,878,655 and 40 cent. We are anticipated to receive $1,589,025 and 86 cent by the end of this physical year. Fiscal year 23-24 is our highest annual payment for our county. Um, the payment amounts decline each year over the next 16 years. Um, on this slide, it uh, just shows you our new payout amount based on the $16 million. Um, you can see that it is significantly higher this year and then continues to decline over the next 16. The next two slides are going to cover Exhibit A strategies. These are high-impact opioid abatement strategies. These strategies include collaborative st strategic planning, evidence-based addiction treatment, recovery support services, recovery housing support, employment-related services, and early intervention, naloxone distribution, or Narcan is the brand name, post-overdose response teams, syringe service programs, criminal justice diversion programs, addiction treatment for incarcerated persons, and re-entry programs. A formal strategic plan is not required before we implement these strategies. So looking at where we are um, across the state um, as far as funding, 46 local governments have reported spending plans from the Exhibit A strategies. This means that a budget resolution has been signed and authorized for specific strategies, but it doesn't necessarily mean that these strategies have been fully implemented yet. 
Um, 24 counties have dedicated funds to collaborative strategic planning, and of those, 15 have utilized settlement funds to hire coordinator positions similar to what my role is. <clears throat> Many counties have dedicated funds to hire um, recovery support services, which is like a peer support specialist or a care navigator for naloxone distribution, post-overdose response, early intervention, and to expand access to medication-assisted treatment. 54 counties are still in the planning and assessment phase. Ex exhibit B strategies are more broad opioid remediation strategies. For purposes of this presentation, I listed a brief description related to each of these strategies, but if you would like to review um, the full descriptions, you can do so by um, visiting the link that's following on the next slide. Um, exhibit B strategies include treatment of opioid use disorder, treatment and recovery, connections to care, support for criminal justice involved persons, support of women, family, and babies, appropriate opioid prescribing and dispensing, preventing the misuse of opioids, harm reduction, first responders, leadership planning and coordination, training and research. Before we can implement um, exhibit B strategies, we first have to go through that collaborative strategic plan. And as you can see here, that four local governments have reported spending plans from exhibit B strategies. And the link that um, I was discussing is at the bottom of that slide. The health department is wrapping up the planning and assessment phase. This phase has involved collecting data and feedback from community stakeholders, municipalities, people who use drugs, individuals in and individuals in recovery. This includes meeting with Living Free Ministries and RTSA, their staff and their program participants. We are considering what does success look like? What are our community specific needs? Where are there gaps in services? And what agencies or organizations are already engaging in this important work? I've participated in monthly technical assistant calls, attended strategy specific webinars, and attended the annual opioid summit hosted by the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners. I have visited Forsyth and Surrey County to learn a great de in greater detail about their programming. Additionally, I have collected opioid and substance-specific data related to Alamance County to help us ensure that we are in compliance with the North Carolina Memorandum of Agreement. So what's next? Local municipalities have been invited tonight, as you have heard um, from two of our court officials, um, to provide feedback and to encourage collaboration. This helps us to satisfy our annual meeting requirement. Vice Chair, at the conclusion of this presentation, if you will please open the floor for anyone else who may be here that would like to give comment. Commissioners, we would like to come before you at your second um, March meeting on Ma uh, March 18th to present our needs and assess and assets to help you understand what we already have and what our needs are. And based on our findings, we will submit recommended strategies to fund for this board's consideration. At this time, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Ms. Thompson. This is just long overdue. <laughs> like Larry said, we went to Orange County, went to Surrey County, um, Harnett County, and Alamance is, um, we just need to look at 50 overdose deaths here in Alamance County last, in 223. I went to your Narcan. It was amazing at the public health department. And uh, it, it's just a really ugly thing to have to look at and not be quite so judgmental in it because um, if you know somebody with cancer, you probably know somebody that's got a problem with, you know, addiction. So uh, I'll say this again, whatever we can do to get this going because the longer we wait, the more people we lose. I have Celebrate Recovery every Thursday night and um, that's way on down the road of recovery and they constantly need support in that. This is something that gets these claws in you and you just have to have strong case management like a recovery court. The Veterans Court in Harnett County is, is a great pattern. Uh, Tony went with us and it was just, um, we just can't be afraid to do something like that. And uh, we can't be afraid to face this because it's killing us, it really is. And it's getting younger. I see where it's getting into our youth because um, young people are very innovative when it comes to putting things in things <laughs> and it takes them out. And uh, Tony had mentioned about a 13-year-old that took half Percocet, he thought, and it was 99% fentanyl, you never woke up. So uh, we just got to go after this like we're going to war because this is a war. So 
I've said this so many times. I want everybody else to say it, but just not me. Mr. Lashley? I don't really have anything to add. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was very, very informative. Just have, you know, just a couple of questions. Uh, did, did we just receive this first? This is not the first payment we've received. No. Uh, was it the third one? Okay. Uh, and we got, what, um, 16 more to go? Or is it four, 14 more to go? I'm just trying to carry it. I'm trying to figure out. We should out. have 16 more to go. 16 more to go. Um, so, so far, maybe Susan, you maybe can help me have, what have we done with the money that we received so far? So those funds are sitting in a designated fund, um, actually a separate fund, mm -hmm. until the county adopts a plan, whether it's a strategy A or strategy B plan, we are not allowed to spend those funds. Okay, that's great. That's good. That's really good. Um, so in essence, when the county... Um, I'm just going to ask, who, who would that be? Would that be the Commissioner's Board or would it be the Board of Health? Commissioners. Commissioners. Okay. Uh, just trying to make sure. So, in essence, uh, I'm trying to figure out right now we probably have, what, $4 million? So, right now, currently sitting in the account is $1.8. $1.8 mm -hmm. is all we have in the account. Okay. Right. That's the reason I was trying to get narrow that down, just to see uh, what, you know, over time we're going to get this money. Uh, it's good to know that we have a certain designated dollar amount that's going to be coming in, although it does decline over time. But I do think that over the next few months, we should be able to sort of get an idea of uh, where we can go with this. Uh, I'm not certain right now is the correct time, but I don't know. I don't know. I was maybe hoping that you could help. <laughs> <laughs> so we will have recommendations for you on strategies that, based on our assessment of our community, um, the needs that are there, the data that is provided, um, because opioid dollars are very specific um, to how we spend them, um, that we will be able to provide you with recommendations on how we should initially begin to use the money um, and then be able to look kind of forward as to what a plan will look like over the coming years. Okay, because the reason I asked that question is because of the diversion center. I just wanted to see if this is kind of an avenue that would uh, divert any funds from the opiate settlement to the diversion center to help help those those people. Would that would that be the case? So we are exploring how we could utilize some of the funding um, to support the diversion center. Um, again, it is very specific funding. It has to be um, so we have to have 51% or more of the individuals who are being served have opioid use disorder. Um, so that does narrow down our window. Um, it also is very specific if we are to fund such as a building, a vehicle, or a capital asset, that at least two strategies have to be um, implemented in that space. Um, and then we also have to take into consideration that of those strategies that are being funded, the individuals that are working in that particular area. So for example, um, if we did the the BHOC and the medication assisted treatment per, um, services. We would have to be sure that the number of staff that were there and the individuals that are being served were meeting our criteria. So we are in the process of exploring what that could look like. Okay. Well, I'll be looking forward to uh, March 18th. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Turner. Thank you, Commissioner Carter. Ms. Evans, is there a deadline to allocate these funds? I don't believe that there is right now. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Is the the Justice Advisory Council involved in the strategies that the health department is developing for these services? Um, so I do present to the Justice Advisory Council, um, typically following um, my presentations to you all. Um, we do have um, the crisis continuum that's involved with this, but we will also um, inform the Justice Advisory Council as well. Are, are they are they part of the conversation? So not just presenting to them but seeking yes yes you know, input yes we will see and, and is via also involved in seeking input on how to use these um we've yeah we work with via um rha i mean honestly we've really tried to work with everyone in the community that's involved with individuals who are suffering from addiction so your presentation to us in march would kind of take into account all those all of the information and that you've that we've been able made to a collect. decision about those mm -hmm. and made some judgments about what's best yes okay Mm -hmm. it. Okay. I have to say that uh, I joined um, Commissioner Thompson 
on the trip to Surrey County to look at their judge, at their uh, recovery court, and uh, was very impressed with what I saw up there and the fact that it, it wasn't, it didn't really have a big impact on the finances of the county. It did, judges were donating their time, uh, basically space and uh, somebody to coordinate it. Um, so I think it's a good opportunity for us to take a look at something like that for Alamance County. Thank you very much. They were just awarded $500,000 grant through the Piedmont Tribe. You know, they presented to us. That's there. right. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's money in that, too. There's money everywhere because our country's on fire with this. You look at our borders, it's coming in. It's just everywhere. And uh, we're not winning. I agree. Um, just as a reminder, if we could um, ask if there are anyone, is there anyone from the municipalities here um, to give comments right. to this? Does anybody on this side of the uh, room want to make a comment concerning the opioid settlement? Okay. How about this side over here? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Okay. We have an employee compensation study coming up. We late. do. I'd be happy to introduce this item if you're ready to, okay. to talk about it. So tonight, commissioners, we are presenting the results of the first phase of the market study, taking one third of the organization and benchmarking the salaries of those with uh, the market that we've established. The county contracted with Baker Tilly, a consulting firm who specializes in employee compensation analysis. And we have Sarah Town, uh, with us tonight as the consultant who's going to walk you through the PowerPoint and then we'll be available to answer questions as, as they happen. So Sarah, thank you for being here tonight and commissioners, thank you for funding this study here and looking forward to the, sharing the results with you and the public. Definitely welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Mm -hmm. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the board. Um, thank you for the opportunity to pr come and address you this evening. As Heidi said, my name is Sarah Town. I'm the consulting uh, manager for our classification and compensation team at Baker Tilly. I'm honored to present the findings of our comprehensive market study conducted by our firm. Um, the insights gathered from the market study really provide an overview of your current compensation at Alamance County and the current market landscape. And the results of this study really pave way to the strategic recommendations that are aimed at really being able to recognize and reward employees um, with fair and competitive pay. And that is our goal with this study. Tonight, I'm gonna to be able to walk you through our full uh, methodology, our recommendations, and where we go from here. So when you're conducting a full course classification and compensation study, there are several determinants of compensation. Something like pay philosophy, whether you're going to lead or lag or match the market. Looking at market, the external competitiveness, who you name as your peer organizations, the labor market itself. You'd also look at a classification or job evaluation, looking at how positions compare across the county and organization to each other. And then there's that personal component, what the employees themselves bring to the role, their seniority, their education, their experience, their performance. So that is a full course study. That is what the county conducted in 2015. For this study, our purpose is really looking at the first two of these, pay philosophy and the external competitiveness, really looking at the market. So we worked through a four phase process with the county, starting with project initiation. It allowed us to have planning meetings to understand the current situation, the need for a market study, establish the goals, what's working, what's not working, and collect all the data. Looking at pay structures, policy handbooks, job descriptions, organizational charts, and then a full census with the names of the employees that we were conducting the study on, the, on behalf of. From there, we moved into our market <laughs> assessment. This is phase two. We partnered with the county to identify comparable and competitive peer organizations that we wanted to reach out to as part of this study. We identified 12 of them. 
Then those 12 public organizations were then included with three published salary source data. It's what we used as private sector benchmarks. We're a private sector company. We can't call each other up and ask each other what they're paying for. Um, private sector companies uh, report into these surveys. That's what we use as well. But overwhelmingly, the majority of the data comes from your public sector counterparts. We included 76 positions as benchmarks in the survey. And then once that data comes in, we do do some data adjustments. So something like work week, if another organization is on a 37.5, you guys are on a 40, we wanna make sure those annualized rates are the same. We may age the data if it's not for the current fiscal year. That in this case, that only happened with the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And then we do a geographic cost of labor differential. It's not the same thing as cost of living, it's similar, but it does take those regional differences um, out of the equation. Most importantly though, we don't weight the data. So no one peer is given preference over another, it's a law of averages that we're working on here. We have a pretty rigorous quality control process. We wanna make sure that there's a significant number of matches. Hard to say, this is the market when you only got one data point. So we require a threshold of at least three matches for each benchmark position. And then we also look at quality of matches. We require a 75% overlap in the duties and responsibilities to really be considered a good match. These are the 12 public peer organizations that the county identified that we reached out to as part of the study. We were able to collect and compile data from all 12 of them. And then the three published surveys that represent our private sector. So if there is a comparable analogous position in the private sector, we are including that in the data set. So like I said, in total, 75 positions as well as one additional position were included as benchmark positions. Only four came back with insufficient data, meaning they didn't meet the threshold of at least four matches. So overall, the study yielded market values for 94% of the county's benchmark positions. From there, we prepared a series of reports, looking at the average minimum, midpoint, and maximum, a comparison of where Alamance County is in comparison to the market, those are all included in our final report, but I just wanted to be able to show a couple of snapshots. So this is an example, a sample, kind of hard to put 76 positions on one slide, so you got a sample here. Um, but this is the market assessment looking at the results. It lists the positions, the number of matches found in the data, and then the average minimum, midpoint, and maximum calculated from those matches. So this just shows us what the market is looking at right now. We did this for every position that we included in the market. And then we did a comparison of where you're at in comparison to market, focusing specifically on three departments within the organization. We're looking at the market rates are currently above positions studied uh, for the county in both EMS and social services, but on average, the market is below positions currently for detention and the ICE departments. So you see this in our final report and then also in this final presentation, there's red and blue arrows for each of the positions. That's normal. What we do see is just this temperature taking of the market. There are positions that are moving at different rates in the market. Um, they're really hot jobs right now, public safety, social services, these are hot jobs in the job market right now. So they're moving at a different pace. And so this allows us to see what is that pace and what is that current rate right now. Ms. Town, can I, can I ask you to back up for just a second? So Absolutely. Make sure something's clear in my mind. If you can go back to slide number seven. Go for it. Um, community paramedicine. So you've got a paramedic and you've got an average minimum, average midpoint, average maximum. Correct. So within paramedic, I mean, there, it could be, you're talking about a, a, the same s uh, scale of paramedic, or, or does, does the term paramedic mean paramedic across 10 years of service or two years of service, and does it include stratification of paramedic? Yeah, that's a great <laughs> question. So when we are looking at positions in the marketplace, we don't necessarily take into account the individuals in the position and how much service they have within those positions. When an organization is adopting a pay structure, they say this is the value of the position in our organization, so this is the range in which we provide that pay. And that's what we're using to compare to Alamance County. So when we're looking at your paramedic, it's not just a title for title. We're not just saying you're a paramedic, you're a paramedic. Sure. We actually dive into the duties and responsibilities, the certifications, the minimum education, education and experience requirements of the position to ensure it's a really good overlap. So your paramedic does look like these 10 benchmarked paramedics. Are there different stratifications of paramedic in our 
just in our organization? Do you want to speak? We have a, a base paramedic and then an advanced intermediate and then a paramedic. So they basically have different skill sets in the break. And well, so if, if, if there are those three designations in our organization, do you account for those in your study or are those all three included in paramedic? They would all be listed as separate benchmark positions. Okay. So we have community paramedic at number one benchmark position. We have paramedic also at okay. number 14. And then your EMTs as well as various. Then I don't understand how the terms average minimum, why is there not a minimum among those 12 counties? Why is there an average minimum among those 12 counties? I don't understand that. Yeah, so you take the minimum from each of the peer organizations, in this right. case 10 for the community paramedic, you have 10 different data points. We average those to get this value here, 47,498. So it is the average of your peers or of the 10 benchmark position. Uh, so, so the lowest data salary points. that you saw from Wake County is compared to the lowest salary you saw from Durham County, and those are averaged. So we take of the paramedic. Correct. We take the minimums of all of the peers, okay. average them to come up with an average minimum for each okay. of your benchmark positions. You. That's the same thing for minimum, midpoint, and maximum. Okay. And then on the next page, number eight, the the uh, arrows down and up. So that indicates where Alamance County would need to go to reach in the first column, the average minimum. So detention and ICE average, red arrow down 3.6. That means LMS County would go down 3.6 to reach the average minimum. Correct. So and what it's saying right now is that the market is 3.6% above um, where you're at. So well, again, the red market is below, blue the market is above. So we're wanting to be able to take a look and see where on average your positions are. So if I've got a blue arrow up, I need to go up. The market is above, so you want to move Alamance up, County salaries up to, up way, to reach to the market. to reach that average minimum. Yeah, and even okay. if we're taking a look at this and we see that across the board, this is, again, on average for all of the positions in these departments. So on average for detention, the average minimum um, is higher than market to the tune of 3.6%. But for this... That doesn't uh, mean we adjust salaries <laughs> down 3.6% to meet the market. But that is it just a further average of detention like. and ICE that is... For this slide, that's an average of all detention and ICE. All of the positions that we For included Alabama. in the market study, okay, correct. Thank you. So there are some positions within that department right. that, that go down or up. Thank down you. or up. Okay. All good. Great questions. So yeah, on average, when we look at all of the 76 positions, 72 that had significant data, the market is 0.5% above the county's starting salaries at the minimum, 2.6% above at the minim at the midpoints, and 3.9% above the county at the maximums. It's giving you an overall sense of where you're at in comparison to the market. Now, this is again a temperature taking. We get to see what the market is looking like and what we do to then adjust your structures. So this is the third phase of our process, pay plan development. We start with an analysis of your existing pay plan to make recommendations for adjustment. And in this case, we developed a new pay plan, really tailored to the study's results. From there, once we have the structure right, we look at grade assignments, where the actual positions go in which grades. And then once we have those finalized, we prepare some implementation calculations. I want to be able to walk you through each of these. Before, this, you, before you do that. Sure. And I, I keep slowing you down, but these are important <laughs> oh, metrics, okay. I think. So the 76 positions you looked at create these average minimum, midpoint, and maximum numbers. Correct, for each of the departments. Do the 76 positions include every position in those three departments? That's a great question, and I think it does, yeah. So every position, and those three departments are EMS, detention, and... Social services. Social services. Correct. Okay, so you look at all seven, you look at all positions in those departments, that's your 76, that's your benchmark, and that's used to determine these averages. Correct. Thank you. And so if it's blue, that means we are above average of the market. The market is above you. Above you, yes. okay. We're so you have 0. 0.5 blue. to go to be competitive with market. You have 2.6% to adjust to be competitive at the midpoints. Okay. And I do want to focus on midpoints, not just minimums, and I'll tell you why. Very good. 
So looking at the current pay plan, this is what you have existing right now. You have an open structure, meaning it's open from minimum to maximum. There are no defined steps. There are 39 grades. They're numbered 55 through 93, and the positions are assigned to a particular grade. We look at two significant data points when looking and analyzing your existing structure. The first is range spread. That's the distance from minimum to maximum, how long it takes somebody to become fully proficient in the role. So all of our pay plans, and as we look at them, they're uh, anchored or tailored to the market at the midpoint. While starting minimums need to be competitive, it allows us to bring talent into the organization. We also don't want to be a training ground. We want to retain employees as well. So the midpoint is commonly referred to as the market value for a position. When somebody is fully proficient in their role, they should be paid at midpoint or near the market. So your current range spreads are 54% on average. Right now it's going to take about nine years for an employee to become fully proficient or paid near the midpoint, the market value for their positions. If you think about some positions in the organization, they could become fully proficient in two or three years. It doesn't take nine years to become fully proficient in your role. Other positions, and many of them in this room, advanced supervisory responsibility, advanced technical responsibility, um, a variety of task and assignment. Yes, it might take longer to become fully proficient in your role. The other data point that we look at is midpoint differential. That's the distance between each grade at the midpoint. You have a lot of overlap in your current pay plan. Wide range spreads, not tailored, and a lot of overlap, very narrow at 4.15% midpoint differential. So if everything is centered around the midpoint, range spreads are then, if you want competitive salaries, you shrink the range spreads. It brings the minimums in. If you need more distanced between supervisor and subordinate, you look at midpoint differentials. So that's what we're doing here in the proposed general pay plan. What we're proposing is a new pay plan. It looks very similar to what you have right now. I, I, I gotta slow you down a little bit. Sure. Right. Um, <laughs> average range spreads, is this data completely internal to Alamance County? On this slide, yes. This yes. is your existing pay plan. And it sa you said nine years from start to midpoint. Correct. Is there an average among those 12 counties for that metric it's from, from higher to midpoint? So from minimum to midpoint? Yes, mm -hmm. minimum to midpoint. Yeah, yes. starting salaries to midpoint, 54% average. Right. That's across all of your grades, yes. That's nine years. But of the other 12 counties that you looked at, do you know what the average is from their minimum to midpoint? Uh, so on the market study, we actually took a temperature and looked at for each of the benchmark positions, what is the average range spread? Yes. You see them tailored here. Some are in their 30s, some are in the 40s, some are in the 50s. Very rarely do we see wide range spreads into the 60s. That's rare. For your competing counties, they are also adopting a tailored methodology. So not just having consistent range spread across the entire organization, but moving in the direction that we're proposing, which is tailored range spreads. A, a smaller range spread? Smaller range spread for the beginning of the grades, wider at the top of the grade scale. Why would you do that? Because the learning curve is different for positions. If you're thinking about the positions that are in the first grades of an organization, the learning curve to become fully proficient in the roles, less time. What can you say about the nine years from minimum to midpoint? It's can wide. You, what does that mean? So it's a long distance. It shouldn't take nine years to become fully okay, proficient. It shouldn't in, take nine years. Okay. Yeah. So what should it be? It depends on the position and in the grades. Narrower at the bottom of the grades, less time to become fully proficient, wider at the top. And are we going to get to the point where, uh, does your recommendation take those that value into account? Yep. Okay. Flip to the proposed general pay plan and you'll I see it. I will, after one more question. Sure. <laughs> if, uh, okay, the current pay plan. Sure. You see the grades on the left? Yes. W what is that? Grades is just a number given to a particular grade or a range. You have certain positions that are assigned to grade 55, 56, 57. So there are grade 55s in both DSS and detention and... Across the entire organization. Across the entire organization, there are 55s. Yep. All of your positions fit within grades 55 through 93. Okay. And, and does that match other counties, or is that internal only to us? This is internal only to you. So this is your current pay plan. Okay. 
Okay. So proposed general pay plan, we start with that tailoring of the range spreads, narrower, shorter range spreads at the beginning, starting at 40%. So instead of taking nine years, we're looking at six years to become fully proficient, widening to 55%. We also looked at really developing a good stair structure as you move up the pay structure, more distance between supervisor and subordinates. So we looked at midpoint differentials, looking at the distance as you go up the pay scale. Again, this is aligned to market at the midpoint to 100%. And then to make your minimums more competitive, we narrow your range spreads. To give more distance between supervisors and subordinates, we widen your midpoint differentials. So when you're looking at the market, and overall it says, in order to catch up to those market midpoints, you need to, be, you need to move about 2.6%. What we don't want to recommend is just take your existing structure and shift it by 2.6%. What that does is overcorrect for some positions and undercorrect for others. So taking a developed approach is exactly what we did. We looked at all of the positions in the organization and made grade recommendations based off of this. So grade assignments where positions are in the pay scale, we looked at external equity, the market, we looked at existing equity, the current midpoints, where they're currently grouped together, career progressions, making sure that everybody's got a good pathway forward, and the supervisor and subordinate separation. Things that we don't consider, those personal allocations. We don't consider the person in the position as, at all. They could win the lottery and be out of here next week. The position still needs to be filled. So what is that position worth, both in the market and internally? We don't look at performance. We don't look at if you're a high performing, low performing employee, doesn't matter to us. We don't look at the longevity or how long you've been associated with the county. None of that is considered when we're making where uh, a position should be in a great and assignment. Basically looking at the value of the asset, right? Just looking at the position. So we actually did this for all of the positions. We reviewed grade assignments with the county's project team just to make sure that every position was in the right place. We addressed any outliers and we made recommendations. Once that was finalized, we looked at then what is this going to cost Alamance County to implement our recommendations. So I will give a couple of caveats. The first is these calculations are based on base pay only. So no shift differential, certification pay, merit, none of those other supplemental pay information is included here. This is just base salaries. Second, I did not get in the business of taking money away from local government employees, and it is Baker Tilly's broad philosophy that we will never recommend a pay decrease for any employee as a result of a salary study. There may be some cases where an employee is, their current salary is outside of the new proposed range. That happens. You have somebody that's been in the organization for 20 years. That happens. Um, what we don't then is reduce their salary so they fit in the salary structure. We wait until the salary structure and the market catches up to where they are. So we may red circle or freeze an employee's salary. And that's what we did for some recommendations here. But the overall, all three of these implementation scenarios result in no decrease for any employee. So the first is we look at employees' existing salaries. If they are below the new minimum, we move them to the minimum. It is the least invasive. It's just to get everybody onto the pay structure. Second option, we look at a greater of situation. So if first move to the minimum, or a 1.5% salary adjustment. So if moving you to the minimum was only 1%, we would instead give you 1.5. Everybody else that was within their range would also get 1.5. This is to give everybody a little bit of something, 1.5%. The third scenario is really the one that is tailored to combat compression. As new employees come into the organization, they may be offered salaries that are very close to more tenured employees. They're kind of overlapping. They may even leapfrog over more tenured employees. So this is meant to build some of that separation back in, give credit for time in position. We look at time in position, not just overall service to the county, because you may have been with the county for 20 years, but made manager last year. We want to make you move through the manager pay range appropriately. So this is looking at uh, starting with everybody moving to their assigned minimum and then a 0.5% times their years in position 
and uh, this is capped at six years, partly due to the, the function of the data that we have. Um, but if an employee had been in their position for three years, they would get a 1.5% adjustment to their salary, pushing them further along into the range. This is the most comprehensive, again, to combat compression. A couple questions there. Uh, Go ahead. Each of these bullets says employees move, employees receive. Correct. Which employees? Uh, all employees that are eligible. So that is any employee that is either below the new minimum or within. The employees that have salaries that are above their new range receive nothing in these calculations. Okay. So, again. but we do look at all employees. Say that one more time. So, if an employee's current salary is above their maximum or the proposed maximum, no additional requirements or no additional adjustments made there, they freeze their salary. All other employees would so get that, an adjustment. So this would apply to employees outside of the three, de three departments that we're talking about. Correct. Okay, I got some questions there. Sure. Um, first of all, we were ta we've been talking about midpoints, mm -hmm. but now we're talking about minimums. So, was the focus not on not on mid? Well, like, why why are we focusing on minimums here when we've been talking about midpoints? Because in implementation calculations, you're looking for what is the budgetary item. We okay. start with moving everybody into their pay grade means the lowest they could potentially be is their minimum or their proposed minimum. Okay. If you're within that range, you retain your existing salary. Okay. And the minimums we're talking about are the average minimums that we that are among the 12 counties. Is that right? The, uh, the minimums that are right now are these proposed general minimums that are based off of market, yes. And the market is the 12 counties? Correct. Plus some other... Plus the that. three published salary services. <sighs> um... You did a benchmark on 76 employees in three departments. 76 positions in three departments. Okay. How, how, do, I, how, how do I take a, a detention officer and apply that to, to a, um, a Parks and Rec employee? Yeah, that's a great question. So I'm going to need my other visual, Cheryl, if I can get the... Um, it's, yeah, Bruce, it's one of the... This keeps scrolling to the end. Sarah, you should get to it. There's a slide at the very end of this presentation that's hidden. If we could Ooh. unhide it. <laughs> so I can have it. Um, so when we look at these three departments, that one, thank you. That's it. We run everything through a regression analysis. We're giant data nerds. We like statistics. So what this picture is going to show you is each one of these blue dots represents a position that we studied in market and the line of best fit. The first or the uh, depiction or the, the graph on the left is your current pay structure in alignment with that new market data. The one on the right is actually what we're proposing. We use this line of best fit through the market data to align the new pay structure with those minimums, those midpoints, and those maximums to fit that line. So even if there are, we're only looking at three departments, they spread and run the whole gamut of the bottom of the pay scale to the very top of this pay scale. So what we can do is adjust and shift your entire existing pay structure to align to the market values. Because not just detention and not just social services are in grade 55 you have Parks and Rec, you have other positions You're in grade 55. Connecting it to the, those numbers that we talked about earlier, the, um, the grades. Grades. The grades are what allow you to connect. Correct. So because there are multiple positions within these grade assignments. Okay. And so you know that a person at six, no, position Very good. that is grade 63 in DSS corresponds to a position at 63 at Parks and Rec. And at, every, at the library and Correct. everything else. Yeah, okay. so the county doesn't currently have a m way of measuring internal equity, but we have your existing pay structure, how positions are currently grouped. Okay. So that's what we're using to align here. So when we're looking at the implementation scenarios, this is the costing for those three options. Option one, a move to minimum. 
Option two, uh, greater of, move to minimum or that 1.5% adjustment. Option three is a move to minimum and then that 0.5% times your years in position. This is capped at six years. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> All good, thank you. Um, so these are, again, base salaries. These are also a one-year annualized salary rate. So in option one, we're looking at all 901 employees. I'll adjust it. Uh, 143 of them are below their new proposed minimum. So option one is just that move to uh, 143 employees. All other employees would retain their existing salary. Option two is also then including the 707 employees that are within range and giving them a 1.5% adjustment. And then option three is also looking at the 143 that are below and the 707 that are within. Again, we looked at all of your employees in all positions as we made this recommendation. Each three of these options are currently within budget. You can make sure that that's confirmed. Um, so that was one of the other aspects is we wanted to make sure that we are offering scenarios that were already budgeted for. So our overall recommendations, where we go from here, um, the first is to approve the proposed pay plan and the position grade assignments. Selecting an implementation scenario that meets your uh, compensation philosophy, your business goals, one that is fiscally sustainable. Um, and then finally, our biggest recommendation is just to continue efforts like this to maintain the classification system moving forward, routinely review positions, keep taking a temperature of market, adjust those pay structures as needed to keep pace with market, and then move employees through their pay ranges as well, advancing employees through their assigned pay range based on performance, based on longevity. So uh, while this study is concluding, we also wanted to be able to prepare you with an implementation strategy. Where do you go from here and not just take the results and then you're left with no implementation options? So the first step is obviously we want to make sure that uh, we have approval for the new pay plan with that implementation scenario connected. Next step for the county is to look at total compensation, looking at rewards, but also benefits, additional pay, retirement, a full compensation benefits package. We'll be actually working with the county to review pay policies and practices, making sure that you have policies that support the new pay structure. Um, further on, we would recommend a classification review and adoption of an internal equity process. You don't currently have one. All of your peer organizations do. Um, so being able to adopt something like that. Mm -hmm. And then finally, um, an annual structure and employee pay adjustments. This is our estimated timeline for one year of implementation. Um, and we're happy to continue working with the county as needed. Um, I will say it is it's been really lovely to work with the county um, and be able to undertake this study at a crucial time when the market is so volatile, um, making sure that you have a competitive and fair compensation structure that rewards employees, <coughs> but also is competitive in the marketplace. Um, thank you for trusting Baker Tilly with our process um, and the data and, and our recommendations. I'm happy to take additional questions that you may have. Could you just real quickly define for me internal equity process? Sure. I'm going to go to my first slide. So when we're looking at a full comprehensive compensation and classification system, compensation, we're looking at pay philosophy, the market, and then you would also have this other component of internal consistency, how these positions in detention compare to those in parks and rec having some kind of system or job evaluation in place would allow you to not just keep pace with market, but give you another data point to understand how your supervisors compare to supervisors in a different department, how your directors compare to each other, how managers compare to each other. That's based off of a, usually a point factor system. Um, best practices are to use math in some kind of systematic format to evaluate all of your positions. You don't currently have one, and I highly would recommend one. It just gives me the impression that this is a real system plan based on position, which is really good. <laughs> okay, thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, you want to be able to understand what is the position valued? What's that value externally in the market, but what's also the internal of that value? Because all of our agencies in this county are valuable. No matter what they do, they play such a role, a part to make it like one complete body. Everybody has to have each other to make it work. Exactly. You need a system and a structure in place that supports all of that. 
Mr. Lashley. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It was very, very informative. Sure. And uh, it's been a long time since I said into regression analysis. <laughs> Happy to. I, I can't wait to get back in it, to be honest with you. Because some of you are here like, mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you I, have, note. <laughs> I have very, very simple questions. You're, uh, you're, sure. You were very thorough, and uh, we're very lucky that we have Commissioner Turner here because he's uh, smarter than you know what. He took three of my questions away. But I, I appreciate that because that means he's paying attention to your, your presentation. He did a great job. I uh, just wanted you to say it again. I know you've said it twice, uh, and I know that folks are watching on TV. I wanted you to go to your market assessment, your range comparison, and I just wanted you to say it again for the tape uh, because the, 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 the numbers, the blue numbers and the red numbers, I can see where that can be quite confusing to someone. <laughs> Certainly. It depends on w which scenario you're thinking about. If you're the finance director, it looks one way. If you're the employees, it looks another. So I, I'm happy to explain this again. So when we are looking at the overall averages in market, we look at the calculated average minimum, midpoint, and maximum, and then we prepare the reports that show where is Alamance County in comparison to market. So taking that first one, EMS, the average minimum currently market is 2.7% above Alamance County. So blue, market is above, red, market is below. Always saying market in comparison to Alamance. Is that Thank helpful? You. Yes, ma'am. Very, very much so. Uh, thanks again. Absolutely. Is that it, Bill? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> thought I'm talking You're to her. You're sweet. <laughs> that you are. Okay, Mr. Turner. Just, just a couple more, Ms. Town. Uh, how do you define the market? It's a market study. How did you define the market? Market is defined in a couple of ways. So the first is who you're looking at as your peer organizations. So defining your peer organizations who look like you, work like you, who are geographically close to you, maybe experiencing similar growth patterns. But really, it's who you're in competition for talent with. That's the good defining peer organization. That's defining market, one, who your peers are. Second is when we're looking at the actual salaries, what is the market value for a position? It's commonly referred to or is the midpoint of the, the range, the distance or that midpoint between minimum and maximum. That's the market value for a position. And if you go to the first page, um, to the pay philosophy. Sure. The, the recommendations that you guys have, does that... What pay philosophy does that, does that set us up for? Yeah, this is currently a match philosophy. So those midpoints are aligned at 100% of market. So a lead philosophy would take a little bit more than market. Some organizations strategically lag because they know their benefits are phenomenal. It's usually a short-term solution. The goal is everybody wants to be at market. Some organizations want to lead. <clears throat> so you currently what we're proposing is a match philosophy. Did you, did you break down some of the jobs within these departments to suggest that we might ought to lead market for some of these roles? No, for because of, oh, go ahead. For instance, where, where there is stiff competition or where you're losing people at a higher rate in this position than in another position. Is that part of what you looked at? Is that part of what you can report to? Yeah, so we look at all of the positions that we included in market and be able to see which ones are moving at a different rate. So some are moving faster, some are moving slower. And then when we're defining <coughs> where's the overall comprehensive, because you have all of your positions in one pay structure, you need a common compensation philosophy that applies equitably across all of the positions. Why? Because they are all in one pay structure. And so being able to have a different compensation philosophy, a lead philosophy for certain positions, right. will lead to compression issues across the organization. Moving some positions without moving others leads to inequity across the organization. Without job evaluation, there's really, you're driven by market. You only have market to be able to determine great assignments right now. What if now. I know I'm down 50% in, on, in, in one position? Is there not an argument that I ought to account for that by leading in that position to obtain employees who have left 
in that position? Yeah, but once you have that one position moved to the tune of 50%, it impacts other positions in the organization, mainly their supervisors. If market is saying they're right at where they need to be at market mm -hmm. and you move the first position or the first uh, entry level position in the organization, mm -hmm. you cause compression. Now there's too much overlap and not enough separation between those supervisors and subordinates. But you said 50%, I didn't say 50%. Is there a number that, we, that it's an acceptable amount of compression in those scenarios? It depends on the position and it depends on really what is the overall uh, career progression for different positions. So we would look at overall separation between supervisor and subordinate. Right now we only have current grade assignments and then market to go off of. Okay, I think we might come back to that, but thank you. Yeah, job evaluation would tell you exactly what is that percentage between them. Okay. Say that again. Jo job evaluation system would tell you more exactly what is what that distance between supervisor and subordinate should be. Right now we're kind of going off of exempt, non-exempt positions where they're currently grouped on the pay scale. I've had, um, I've had some questions about the study. Some people have been looking at it online and uh, there were some questions about comparing Alamance County to Orange, Wake, Durham, Guilford, can you just review the reason we use those four counties in addition to peer counties and other sources? Yeah, I'll, I'll look to my partners because we did really work with the, the county uh, leadership team to identify who these 12 peer organizations are. Um, again, they were kind of based off of the reasons I selected, organizations that look like you, work like you, geographically close, and who you're in competition for right. talent with. Um, and then as to the specific ones you listed, I'll leave it to, to Heidi and uh, Cheryl to come in. Um, I will say that, again, this is, we don't weight the data. No one peer is given preference over another and no one peer is given, uh, it's not swaying the data in any given direction. Law of averages, looking at the 12. You want me to take that? So we came up with these 12 benchmarks because of all the reasons that Sarah has articulated. But in particular, the ones that you've just named, those are the um, counties that we are losing talent to. So we sometimes feel like we're a training ground where we're bringing in employees and then we look at the, the uh, minimum hiring rates at those counties you named right. being significantly higher than Alamance and we're losing employees to them. So it was a competitiveness strategy that we wanted to take on to say, what do they pay and can we become a little more in line with them? I think when we take one position and look at the uh, entry level pay, it was towards the very bottom of those 12 benchmarks. And so this is moving us more towards the middle, towards the midpoint. We still know that the pay in those four counties is significantly higher, but we couldn't bring you a market study that only focused on those four counties. And that goes to the, the pay philosophy conversation about, you know, do you want to meet the midpoint or meet the market pay or do you want to move towards leading or lagging? Well, and, and some of what I've heard too, <clears throat> well, what's going on with my voice tonight, Scar? Excuse me. <clears throat> Make sure I can be heard. Um, uh, one of the things we're dealing with is not all salary related. One of the things we deal with that we need to take another look at, and I think you mentioned that earlier, once we try to work on standardizing our salaries, come back and take a look at our benefits options to bring them in a line with competition as well. So that's another step. This is not, this is not a step that will be done in one meeting or one event. We're going to be working on this. Um, uh, I've had some, some, some issues shared with me. Sheriff has shared with me some issues with some staff that he's not been able to acquire uh, because of competitive reasons on uh, benefits versus salaries. They might be able to come in and make more money here, but once they had to deduct for the cost of benefits they had someplace else, they didn't leave they did, or didn't come to us. Um, and I guess one of the questions that we have to face, as you just pointed out, too, is where do we want to be? Uh, do we want to lag the market, which is 
we've been in the position where we were lagging it in the past. I think we're a little bit better now than we were then. We're not lagging it as bad as we were, but we're somewhere in that midpoint on these positions, or do we want to try and lead? Uh, the question is, how long can we continue to lose people and not find people to replace them? We've got a real challenge trying to get people in. I know the sheriff's office today just had a hiring event. I hope that was successful. I haven't had a chance to talk to him yet about how many people attended, but um, so that's kind of where we need to go. What position do we want to take? Lag, match, or lead? And what we're, I'll remind, what we're proposing is a match philosophy for now. You, looking at where you're at overall in market, that 0.5% at the minimums is really, in my mind, that's at market already. It's then, as you get up into the pay grades and into the ranges, midpoint being 2.6% off of market, maximum being 3.9% off of market, that's just a function of your two wide range spreads. Well, if we go, for example, if we were to go to a match philosophy, <laughs> and we were to find out that wasn't improving our situation. What do we have to do then to change position? Yeah, so when we're looking at, I like to think of a salary structure as the foundation of which you start your compensation strategy. So if you have a good structure in place, like the one that we're proposing that is aligned to 100% of market with tailored, really looking at great assignments systematically as well, you'll be able to adjust that on an annual basis to keep the pace of market. And it won't be, if you do it annually as opposed to let's wait and do it every five years, that's when it becomes very costly. If you're making incremental adjustments right. year after year, it doesn't become costly to implement. And we like to say that this is not magic, it's math. So you can adjust the numbers to look at market annually each year and that is that is certainly what we're recommending with your year one implementation just a couple more questions um i think we had originally thought that we would study a third of the organization uh and then another third and another third um, this proposal hits all employees correct is there then a need to do a second phase of the study with another third of the organization if we've already taken care of the whole organization? Yeah, so this, uh, the one third that you're talking about was just viewed in market. You still wanna continue that to take a temperature and market every single year. Okay, so next year third. would be a different third of the organization and making adjustments. What we're doing here also in this pay plan design is a recalibration of your system to new market conditions. So it is fiscally sustainable over time. And it's not a huge lump sum adjustment by freezing salaries for two thirds of your organization and making adjustments only on one third every three years. Um, and then with your regression analysis, the plan, the subsequent phase would still hit the first phase employees because you're, you're by the same token, you're, you're hitting all employees again. Absolutely. Yeah, you always want to adjust the salary structure annually and move employees annually. Bowling, doing both keeps pace with market, keeps you competitive. That also leads to, in a couple of years, you could be in a very good position to lead market on all of your positions, is not a, just the certain ones. Is there a, the is there a reason to, um, to delay your work, assuming it's you, on the second, t the second group? Is there a reason to delay that a year, or can you not do that? in anticipation of this year's budget cycle. Is there value to doing it sooner because implementation would be more current? So I'm gonna try to answer your, your question um, and let me know if I'm getting it right. Um, but being able to look at a third of your positions right now based off of the market study that was conducted in November. No, based on the new market study. And you wanna be able to take a new separate two, th uh, another one third, a different one third of the organization, study and market, um, and adjust pay structures again. I'm asking if that has value to do it now as opposed to, uh, to be able potentially to implement June, July 1st. Yeah, when you say now, a market study is a full month or several month 
long plan. We started this uh, study in October, um, is, is and there, so doing is there benefit working to ask you to do whatever work you need to do to have it complete by May to allow for decisions to roll into a budget year that would be implemented in July, as opposed to doing using the same calendar that you use this year with the next third. You, you understand what I'm saying? Is I there do. a benefit to that, or, or is it, or is it? Or do you need the extra time to let the market sit so that there's no real benefit in rushing it? Yeah, there's no real benefit in rushing it because it's also a, a time worthy endeavor to be able to do right. So one would be able to identify the next third of positions to go into a market study. Fielding a market study takes anywhere between a month and two months, then time to allocate. So being able to get results in time for May for an implementation in June would be difficult. Um, and there's not that much time between when you did November and when you're doing another market study, I would say, give more time for the market to adjust because there's a lot of organizations that are currently on mid-year cycles. There are some folks that are doing the annual and preparing their budgets right now. You're not quite sure what is going to happen in the next six months in that market. It leaves us with the position of having to budget a number that we don't know what it will be. Because, because that's what we did this year. We budgeted a number to implement the study not knowing what the actual cost would be. Yeah. Um, is there no, there's no way to, I mean, what, what if the results were ready in, well, June's too late. So if, if May, you can't get it done by, between now and May is what you're saying. Correct. Um, but what you can do is looking at what currently you have if we're adopting what you have right now. Instead of delaying uh, an implementation for the proposed pay plan right now, um, what you have is being able to impact 707 employees that are currently within their ranges and 143 that are currently below their market. So being able to make those adjustments right now allows them to then settle into the market a little bit more, have six months and then take another temperature of market and be able to then run some implementation. Yeah. To be able to budget that, we can easily give you some projections of this proposed phase one well, implementation. And I'm not saying not implement this, I'm just saying speed up the, the next phase is what, is what I'm saying, which I, is, is, could be more helpful to folks. Certainly. I'm curious, does the county have a recommendation about which of these options? Yeah, we like the third option because in addition to the market piece, you are also able to start addressing some of the compression issues within departments. And we also like that it spread this over more positions uh, other than just the, the third that had the market study. But I did want to clarify that there is still a second, th the second third and the third third would still need the market analysis done on those positions. This does not address the market piece for those. This is just advancing the, the whole pay plan up to market based on these benchmarks. But those would be years two and three. They would based, be. Based upon what we're talking about in terms of Correct. the time it takes to do this. Yes. But this would bring the entire base up as opposed to only one third of the base. Correct. Correct? Yes. Initially. Yes, and <coughs> you could, you know, assume then that your second and third phases would be potentially Basically confirmation, less, hopefully. less impactful or less costly. Right. Less costly for sure. Yeah. Sure. The costs of the implementation. Yes. Because you're moving a, every employee and looking at all positions as you're making grade assignments. So just studying one-third in market, but making adjustments on the overall pay structure impacting all positions lessens the cost in year two and three. Well, see, I True. thought the reason why you took 70 people is because you needed to get a statistical good sample. And I know that you spread that over. I like the numbers, the way the grades that you made to determine which ones that you made. But what, I, what I'm saying is, is I like the idea of the other two-thirds being a market survey. That being said, this particular implementation of 700 employees get the benefit of the third that was not in the study. 
Absolutely, and that continues year after right. year. So Everybody it, would have some kind of adjustment right. or, or look over as where are you at in comparison to market? Are we making adjustments to, to market for all positions? And that's the one thing I was going to say uh, to, to Mr. Turner's question was that this implementation that we're having is going to help a considerable amount, 704 of 901. That's, that's big. So when I look at the implementation for the second and third, will there be will there be metrics that we will have to look for or is there things that we would have to do in six months to take a look at? I'm, I'm asking. I, I don't know. That's why I'm saying what would be the next step to implement, to, to say, uh, to, to go what Mr. Commissioner Turner said, when would we get that metric that would say, okay, we got to do the other, other, other third? Yeah, so just looking, the timing of a market study and survey, you want at least a couple of months between when you conducted your last study and, and your next one. Um, but doing it on an annual cycle, so you're making structural adjustments and employee pay adjustments annually. Um, we've put this idea of the classification review and adopting an internal equity process before your next market study because establishing that internal equity how you compare jobs across the county will really help facilitate that that market study. So your next adjustments have more data to be able to to look at um, and and really make adjustments more more fully comprehensive. Are you ready for motions, or are we just still talking? Well, I was just going to make one more comment. I was it it really uh, one of the biggest surprises I got was that option three comes in for the whole whole base below what we budgeted for one third of the staff. Yeah. So, I mean, this is all within the budget we have for this year. Uh, I think after going through something like this before and it was unable to be implemented, I think option three is the way we need to go. Would you like to make a motion to that I effect? just did. <laughs> do we have a second? Yeah, I'll second it. Any further discussion? I, I do. I, I do have further discussion. Okay. Um, if we were to implement implement this as of January 1st, did you mean implement it as of January 1st? I'm going to listen to exactly what you're fixing to say. <laughs> if, we were, if we were to implement this as of January 1st, yes. uh, the, the, the 860 is really half of 860. Correct. 430. Mm -hmm. So it's 430 uh -huh. it, right around there? Um, we budgeted $889,000. 887 I think it was, wasn't it? 887 mm -hmm. Um, why, why did we pick these three departments to benchmark? We wanted to start with the three departments that we knew were experiencing high turnover, having difficult uh, recruitment, we were having difficult getting qualified applicants. Um, we're seeing, um, like we know there's a shortage of paramedics across the United States. There's a lot of factors that led us to say that these three departments were experiencing something special and difficult. And we were hoping that by starting a market study on that, we would be able to become more competitive and hiring and retaining employees in those departments. So there, there's there's more attrition in these departments. Yes. Um, do we know where the attrition is going to? Yes, in some cases. So when we were doing exit interviews, we're able to see if they share with us where they're going. And that goes back to why we chose some of these benchmarks. We were losing employees to the Guilfords, Durham's, Oranges, because of the pay, essentially. What's 887 minus 430? Uh, 457? Yep. And is that, I'm sorry, it is actually 889,000. Yeah, 889. So 4, 459 is the difference. Mm -hmm. um, he, 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 I want to do this. I want to do option three. I second option three. I think that's great. As of Jan and I, I would, I'd, I'd like to amend that when the proper time comes to make it effective Jan January. Why don't you do the first and I'll... Second you. <laughs> okay. Would you accept, accept that I'm constantly the second you anyway, so go ahead. All right. <laughs> I'd make it effective January 1st. That's, that's the admitted motion. I, my concern, I fundamentally disagree with the concept 
that you can't have a match for some of the organization and a lead for other parts of the organization. And maybe that's like a private sector kind of principle, but I just see where the reason we started with these departments is because we're losing people yeah. in these departments. Certainly. And, and I'm, I'm, I feel great that this affects the whole organization, but I wonder if as part of the data that you've already done, is there some analysis that would show if we provide a little bit more to certain positions in these departments where we're losing people, is there more work that we can do and, and try to lead the market in these places where we know we're losing people? And so it's kind of a hybrid philosophy, which I'm okay with. I think that makes sense. And then can we, could, we, could you come back at another meeting after having looked at that data over these positions to say, you know, there's an additional $459,000 that is budgeted, that if, if, that would, if that would curb the tide of, of losing people, you know, social workers in DSS, detention officers, EMS folks who, are, who might go to, to Wake County. I, I don't think we're ever going to match Wake County. I just don't think we will. But I think there may be some more we can do here with money that's already budgeted. And so I would hope that we would ask that her to come back with that, with that data. That's not part of the motion, but that's what I hope we might, we might do. Well, in that vein, I've already asked for us to take a look. You know, this is half of what we budgeted, less than half, really, of what we budgeted. So I've asked us to take a look at the benefits piece that needs to shore up where we need to be. If, you know, if you give somebody X number of dollars and they look at Alamance County and that X number of dollars looks good and then they get here and they've got to pay for stuff that they were getting compensated for at their previous employer that takes them down below, takes their net down below where they would have been, they just stay, stay where they are. So we're not, gain, we're not getting people in some cases because we're not where we need to be in the whole package. So we need to take that broader look at not just dollars and salaries, but benefits as well and make sure that we're competitive across the whole market, at least, at least trying to meet the market. So I'll okay. answer by we hope at Baker Tilly that we'll continue working through this process together. Um, and certainly after implementing and developing the new pay plan, um, then we can look at total compensation, all of those other components. If there are additional adjustments that we need to make to, to positions, we can certainly take a look and see where we need to go from there. Okay, we have a motion and a Start second. over. What are you saying? Because <laughs> we've done flipped. Go ahead, start over. <laughs> I, I move that we uh, impl implement option three as of January 1st. And I second. All in favor say aye. 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 It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. County manager, county attorney's report. There is no news to report. No new report. Aww. That's an excellent report. I just a lot to do. <laughs> Here you are filling in the night and you didn't get to say much. Well, she's going to talk about something. Okay. Can't you think of something? That. Totally okay with that. Let's talk about Rick. <laughs> Let's talk about Rick. <laughs> Not only is Chair Paisley uh, out ill tonight, but so is our county attorney. He's yes. dealing with COVID, unfortunately. That's so. great. Um, okay. County manager's report. Yes. I first want to say thank you for implementing this study. Employees have been anticipating this for quite some time, and your swift action to implement is going to be meaningful to them. So thank you for your commitment to helping advance salaries and embarking on this longer term study and implementation of this market piece. Uh, Commissioner Turner had asked me to give an update on the Diversion Center tonight. So I have a couple of bullets that I wanted to share with you about where we are with the Diversion Center. We're still on track for our spring opening. You heard that from Baya a few uh, months ago. Construction <coughs> seems to be on track. They did a tour with the state director for the Department of Mental Health, Substance Use, and Intellectual Developmental Disabilities of the facility uh, in early January, and they're really impressed with the plans and the impact that this can have on our community. Um, VIA has told us that they are exploring some additional funding from the state to help supplement uh, that shortfall that we've been right. made aware of. 
So we're hopeful that uh, that might come through and we're just waiting to hear. Uh, they're ordering furniture and beds, uh, the crisis center beds, so they're working on getting that. And the furniture that they selected, uh, they were able to find some cost savings in that, further reducing some of that shortage. So that was good news. Um, they are working on a request for proposals for uh, exploring options for private security. Um, we are struggling to figure out how to provide security with some of the shortages that we have with our own law enforcement. So we're just wanting to make folks aware that we may issue an RFP. They're still in discussions about that um, now. Um, VIA is meeting with EMS and uh, Elements Regional Medical Center to create protocols for the Divergent Center. So a very important part of how they'll function. And they're also reaching out to community partners to explore the wraparound services that might be able to uh, partner with our diversion center. So we're in the midst of doing that as well. And then there is a request. We've had a recommendation come through your um, JAC, your Justice Advisory Committee. They are discussing naming of the center. It's a decision that the commissioners would need to make, but they have two recommendations that they'd like for you to consider for the naming. Uh, the first is Alamance Behavioral Health Center. And the second is Behavioral Health Center of Alamance. So I share those with you. Don't need any action, but welcome feedback or input um, into the naming. So that is my update on diversion. Commissioner Turner, was there something specific you're looking to hear about within the scope of that? No, thank you, though. Okay. That's great. I do have a question, though, about uh, what we're expecting results from the roof engineers yes. and the HVAC engineers relatively yes. soon. Is that what you Very soon, mm -hmm. yes. Our plan is to do a preview from staff at your um, board retreat scheduled for the 29th of this month. We won't have dollars necessarily assigned at that point, but it will be a preview. And you'll recall that we're getting their top 20 roofing and top 20 HVAC needs. Uh, so we, you'll be hearing uh, about the most critical needs first. And then we have invited them to present at your first February meeting, them being the engineers right. that we've contracted with, to come and do an official report to you all and sort of vet through those projects a little bit deeper with some solid numbers. With dollars. Yes. And, and the top 20 was, was uh, created by the ABSS, is that right? No, the top 20 is coming from the engineers who are assessing <clears throat> the needs. Okay. So they're looking at the most critical of county facilities and um, ABSS facilities, and then giving you 20 roofs and 20 HVAC units that are in the most critical need. Okay. Thank you. Do you want to know what those are? 19 of them are in our building. One is ours. Just saying. Yeah. Next. Okay. Um, also in your uh, agenda packet is the second quarter financial reports. If there are questions about any of those items, we're happy to, to talk with those, talk through those with you. And that's all I have. I just have one question. Sure. I'm looking over all these numbers under our ACC's Capital Reserve Fund. Uh -huh. um, they've got the ending of month. December is um, $3 million and some dollars. Um, is that what they've got? Because whenever we did the voting on the center and everything, I thought they had $100,000 left. I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry. Yeah, let us pull those numbers real quick. Um, she's asking about the ABSS capital reserve. Um, yeah, because I thought they emptied that out with them putting in with everything to when we voted, and they only had $100,000 left. How about ABSS? No, ACC. ACC. Because this says they've got over $3 million. That makes sense. So that transfer has not been completed okay. yet, but once it has been, then it will be that. Okay, year. thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't know if the ferry had given them some more money or something. No, ma'am. <laughs> they don't have that pot of gold like we all wish we had. And uh, our new uh, president of, of Alamance Community College will be attending, I believe, our February meeting, our first meeting in February, am I correct? I uh, had not heard that, but I think I have received an email. He will be here February 1st, awesome. so I haven't heard exactly when they're going to schedule him, but I know he's going to okay. be coming in to meet us. 
That's uh, Dr. Ken uh, Engel. Um, okay. Commissioner comments. You've had all you need tonight, right? <laughs> 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 Nothing else, okay? Burned you out. Commissioner Thompson. I just want to concentrate one more time on the recovery court. I've talked about this since I've been on the board, and we've always had judges. They had a team when we first started looking at it that were very supportive, and um, it's, it's just very important that we do everything we can to help. It's, a, it's such a controversial Thing, a lot of judgment, a lot of frustration, a lot of everything, but um, we just got to get our plan in order to do the right thing by our citizens, no matter who they are. And um, when I see the progress that Surrey County's made and Orange County's made and Harnett County's made, I mean, we're none of these counties, but we're our county, and we've got big, big problems. And um, I just want us to really, here's a courtroom right here. <laughs> We can make it happen no matter what we have to do, and we've got great leadership in our court system that can can work this out. And we've got a new public defender. I know he can't wait to get a hold of stuff like this, so it's just um, we've got really great people in leadership that can take this to the next level. Mr. Lashley? I don't have anything in particular. I just wanted to um, uh, just make a comment about your second quarter financial numbers. Okay. They look really good. <laughs> I know we're only halfway through, we're right. seven twelfths of the way through, but it's promising. It still doesn't take away from the fact that the budget process this year is going to be extremely difficult. That's it for me. Absolutely. Um, I agree with you 100%. It's going to be, it's going to be a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, I have no additional comments, so do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. We are adjourned. Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Commissioner meetings typically occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. The first Monday meeting begins at 9.30 a.m. and the third Monday meeting begins at 6.30 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting will be broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about their schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com youtube.com forward slash Alamance County NC or by clicking the YouTube link on the county website. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of this meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about the commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the county commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.